Welcome to the fourth episode of First Fuel, a podcast bringing you perspectives on the role of energy efficiency, energy management and demand response in the energy transition playing out in Australia and around the world. I'm Luke Menzel, CEO of the Energy Efficiency Council, and this week I'm joined by the former head of the Clean Energy Regulator, professorial fellow at Monash University and chair of the Energy Transition Hub's strategic advisory panel, Chloe Munro. Welcome, Chloe. And how are you travelling as we all contemplate what life looks like post-lockdown, at least here in Australia? Well, hello, Luke, and th thanks for the invitation to uh, participate in this podcast and webinar. Um, look, I'm uh, one of the people, I think, who will be last to emerge from the <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> I've unleashed my, my inner recluse, and uh, I, for all sorts of reasons, uh, quite like it. Um, and uh, And I'm also in a high risk category. So I think, you know, when, when you look at people, there's probably three groups. There's people who are uh, going to be afraid for their health for some period of time and will be cautious. There's people who have suffered real economic privation and are very concerned for their economic welfare and they'll be cautious. And then there's people who just can't get wait, wait to get back out there. And I think particularly people with kids can't wait for the playgrounds to be open for schools to be back and just to be able to resume all of those activities i'll give you a, thing... a, sorry chloe i'll, I'll give you a, a subcategory which is people that are, are quite enjoying working from home but would be also be quite happy to see the kids go off to school which is probably where i'd, I'd place myself <laughs> yeah well i think i think that's right and i think that's one of the really interesting things about how um things are going to change afterwards that certainly i mean a lot of people are saying they want to go back to work but maybe not all the time and there's plenty of people who have been quite surprised by how easy it's been to adjust to uh, working remotely mm. and, and will be keen to do it we've seen lots of stories about that um but what i was going to say is the one thing that i really miss is live performance and and mm. um uh if i could go to the odd live show but otherwise stay in my shell i'd be very happy <laughs> <laughs> well um uh when we uh were chatting about catching up this week chloe um little did we know that there would be so much to talk about it's been an in incredible week in in energy and climate news kicked off on on monday by that uh, quite extraordinary uh, four corners re report which reflected on some of the uh, the highlights but uh, more so the lowlights of our, our journey on climate policy here in australia then on on Tuesday, of course, we had the release of the long-awaited King Review, the uh, the review led by Grant King in, into uh, the Emissions Reduction Fund, which you, in your former role of Clean Energy Regulator, obviously oversaw as, for a number of years. And then today, um, merely hours ago, uh, we had uh, the release of the discussion paper on the government's long-awaited technology investment roadmap. So plenty to discuss and uh, I suppose working our way through the week Chloe is as good an organising principle as any so I, I thought I'd kick, kick off and, and perhaps provide a little bit of context for the rest of the conversation by asking your reflections on that Four Corners report on Monday. Uh, yes well it was quite scarifying really and um, I, I think we should talk about it then put it aside because it really does set the scene for the political context and it, it, it was uh, uh, pretty terrible really to see um, some of our most eminent thinkers express such grief and anger about Australia's inability to uh, commit to a serious climate policy over the last decade and how climate issues have really been hijacked for um, divisive differentiation in, in, in political terms in a very what can only be seen as a destructive way um, so um, I certainly empathise with a lot of that and like the people on the show have a certain amount of PTSD from <laughs> the experience. Uh, it really was very tough um, period of my life in lots of ways, although I'm, I'm proud of what we achieved at the Clean Energy Regulator and I, I'm, I'm proud that it's uh, still there and, and, and making, making a difference in terms of emissions reduction. Uh, but the, the the fact is this um, that in order to um, make serious inroads and for Australia to uh, make a reasonable contribution to seeing off the risk of dangerous climate change and catastrophic temperature rises, uh, there has to be a transformation across the whole economy. And uh, we've stuffed around for the last decade, so now we have to move faster 
than we thought uh, back then. And that really is very difficult to achieve if you don't have some sort of economy-wide instrument to do it. And whether it's an emissions trading scheme or emissions intensity scheme or a clean energy target or any of those things, the point of all of them is that they apply very broadly across all industries and they uh, make the bad things more expensive and the good things cheaper. And that gradually helps um, shift the dial. So absent that, uh, what we've seen this week is uh, some very interesting policy releases uh, which show some commitments to reducing emissions, but they don't have that whole of economy flavour. Which is certainly certainly our reflection and, and some of the views I've seen coming out from some of our, our friends and partners in the space, which is, you know, broadly welcoming uh, the, the overall thrust of the documents that have been released this week, but really making the point that has been made repeatedly um, for, for a good 10 or 15 years now, Chloe, that without uh, that uh, clear target, what we're aiming for in terms of uh, likely 2050 and net zero emissions is the, is, is the emerging political consensus, uh, at least coming from the states. It hasn't yet been picked up at the federal level. Um, and then the mechanism which we can drive, with which we can drive that across the economy. Of course, that's not going to solve all our problems, but it, it, it will, you know, provide the uh, the basic framework for solve it, mm. for working through those issues. Yeah, well, I mean, I think my view has always been that it was uh, something like a broad-based price on carbon. However, you achieve that, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Mm. And yes, you need to have a trajectory, and that was uh, the one recommendation in the Finkel review. Uh, if people can remember back that far. Well, exactly. Uh, I mean, I, you have a very storied career, of course, Chloe, and, <laughs> and I didn't even mention that you were a member of the Finkel Re Review yeah. panel. And uh, can you believe that? So, well, let's see. I'm right in saying it's only three years ago now. It seems like a very, very long time ago. Yes. Well, that's right. And, and I was reminded of that because there was a very swift consultation on the um, Energy Security Board, which mm. we'd recommended was not set up in statute, partly because it would be quicker, uh, but also because it would have a limited life as a kind of program office driving coordination of a reform agenda, which broadly it's done, although it's, it hasn't been able to drive that as fast as uh we would have liked um but that reminded me that it was it was three pretty much three years and and um you know there's a lot in the Finkel review that is still in train and that is perfectly relevant uh and as i say the, the one recommendation that the government didn't accept was to have a trajectory and i i just think without that um framing uh everything else is um maybe a little bit half-hearted but more importantly, you know, the, 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 this requires, and the longer we leave it, the harder it is, as Ross Garno said way back with the Garno review. And when was that, mm. 2005 or six? Or seven, something? I think. Yeah. Uh, se seven, maybe just before Kevin 07. Oh, yeah, that would be right. But anyway, <laughs> you know, so we knew that then. Um, and uh, so we now found ourselves in precisely the position that was predicted. Mm. Uh, that it just it gets harder uh, if you don't have a coherent and uh, really purposeful approach and a trajectory really helps and people know where they are and where they're going and that helps reduce uncertainty to an extent so that's a that's a miss but um, you know I think we we've most of us have come to accept that that is the political reality and so we're all quite pragmatic about um, finding where we can things that will make a difference and um, there are lots of examples of that and uh, lots of areas where there's been surprise on the upside uh, renewable energy obviously is one where again if you look back at the Finkel review and you look at what we were thinking about costs then relative costs uh, it just seems woefully out of date um, and that will you know the success of renewables will continue to be a shining light but it needs to be accompanied by a whole load of other things where we've made less inroads and you know unfortunately energy efficiency is one of them where there are you know there's there are some great um, advances and some great stories but overall we haven't taken advantage nearly as much as we could of the first fuel, as you would say, and, and, and that's um, something still to be grappled with. 
It absolutely is. And uh, maybe that's a good jumping off point for the next uh, part of our discussion, because a, a key topic uh, of the, the King Review and, and what they were tasking, tasked in considering was, was the question of, uh, of the types of uh, abatement opportunities that were being driven by the ERF and, um, and some of the ones that were perhaps uh, not getting uh, supported in, in the way that many stakeholders thought they should. Um, but just as, before we dive into the detail, uh, Chloe, obviously you've had a couple of days probably to uh, flick through the King Review over a cup of tea there, over, over there in, uh, in, in, in self-isolation. Um, what are your sort of high-level reflections on the, uh, on, the, on the review and I suppose also on the government's response? Well, um, let, let's start with the review itself. And in a way to do that, we have to step back to what the Emissions Reduction Fund is and what it isn't. And uh, in a way, you know, it's, it, it's a curious beast, the Emissions Reduction Fund, because it actually maintains the architecture, despite the fact the government would never want to acknowledge this, it retains the architecture of emissions trading. Hmm. So on the one hand, there's a process for issuing carbon units, uh, in this case, Australian carbon credit units. And on the other side, there's a demand for those units. Mm. And in, under the Emissions Reduction Fund, well, I guess there's three sources. Uh, there's, um, but the predominant one is government purchasing. So the fact that it's uh, dominated by government purchasing creates certain peculiarities. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, on the crediting side the so a carbon credit unit represents a ton of carbon abated and that can either be through sequestration or avoidance so the key to that is that there has to be a method for calculating what the abatement's been and, and, and only issuing those units when the abatement has actually occurred and so you have these methods and the methods are really quite elaborate and they're developed for different uh, kinds of projects uh, that do sequestration or abatement. And at the time that the emissions reduction fund got going, and it was, it was quite slow, there, there, there was a, there'd been a lot of work by a lot of parties, particularly in land-based abatement, and that's capable of producing really large volumes at relatively low cost. Um, mostly in um, avoided deforestation or reforestation, those sorts of things. Uh, so that took off like a rocket. There were also uh, waste projects which had um, uh, and their emissions avoidance effectively, the um, flaring methane or um, um, potentially diverting it to power generation. So they were there and they, they were um, grandfathered to use that unfortunate phrase from previous schemes. And so they were up and running and they were also able to offer quite a lot of low cost abatement. Um, but the, po the point is that these methods are there to guarantee, not to guarantee, but to make, give some confidence that the emissions that are credited are genuine and additional. And uh, there's a number of issues around that I won't bother to go into, but it does create uh, a complexity to the scheme and there are transaction costs associated with that. And then uh, because the uh, units aren't issued until after the abatement's been delivered, then uh, the project proponent has to finance their project up front. So some of the recommendations were addressing all of that. So there's, mm. there's a bunch that are um, quite sensible recommendations and some of which have been on the wish list for a while I think around method development and in fact some of them are reinstating uh, approaches that were there before like having a priority list and allowing proponents to propose methods so that's all good. Um, some of it's about trying to uh, lower the transaction costs by making the processes easier for proponents uh, a lot of that is good and, and, and very sensible. Some of it will probably dilute the integrity of the scheme a bit, but I've never been too precious about that because yes, the government might pay for 10 tons of abatement and in reality it's only really got eight, but mm. you know, it's still mm. getting mm. some quite reasonably priced abatement. So that's that slight dilution. I don't, don't think it's something to worry about. Um, and then there are some there are, there there are some, there's a, there's the the big ticket item uh, and the one which 
will be controversial, I guess, which is about the safeguard mechanism and, and uh, the crediting that they're proposing under the safeguard. Now, it's absolutely true that when the emissions reduction fund was developed uh, in the back of the mind was the idea that it could convert into a baseline and credit scheme uh, where um, the, the facilities that are covered by the scheme would be able to earn credits if they didn't emit to their baseline and they would be able to trade those with other facilities that did and all of that would have to happen under the envelope of some sort of declining baseline where the emissions intensity across the whole you know of the individual um, facilities or across the whole economy as it were was declining so that's quite a complicated thing to achieve and and the government has um, accepted that recommendation in principle but really the devil's in the detail that's clear from the mm -hmm. recommendation which is quite complicated um, uh, provisions around how it might work uh, and the government is proposing a lot of consultation so whether that is a step towards um, a broad based uh, baseline and credit scheme that covers all of those 200 facil odd facilities or not um, I'm not entirely sure um, but you know, maybe it's a step in that direction. I think. I think the the difficulty. I mean, there are difficulties with it. One of the difficulties is that when you look at the baselines that have been uh, awarded, it's an administrative process to those facilities that are covered by the safeguard mechanism, which are pretty much the same facilities that were covered by the carbon pricing mechanism. By the way, so you know, it's all still going back to the same architecture um but the baselines were deliberately set in a way that wouldn't bite aggressively so there's a lot of headroom when you add them all up there's a lot of headroom there have been some facilities that breached their baseline so and um there are various mechanisms by which they can come back into compliance but in fact some of them have chosen to surrender carbon credit units so they've gone out into the market and bought carbon credit units um, there was about I think the, the uh, facility the safeguard mechanism covers about um, 114 million tons of emissions in the economy something like that and the in, in 2018 there were around 190,000 tons worth of credit carbon credits that were surrendered so you can see the the demand in that sector for uh, credits to cover um, exceedances if you like over the baseline is pretty small uh, certainly compared to the amount of headroom that is in the baseline so there's you know how you get the supply and demand to balance up you need scarcity for a market to work mm, and for mm, there to be a mm. price that makes it worthwhile so there's all of these questions um, the other comments I'd make before you stop me rubbing on rubbing, is I think that there's a slight and I may be reading between the lines but the there is a general tone i think in most of the things that the government has done whether it's the bilateral deal with new south wales around energy security or whether it's you know looking at a high emissions low um that's sorry <laughs> i put it wash my mouth high high efficiency low on, emissions yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> high, <laughs> i was right the first time uh, <laughs> high efficiency low emissions it's all relative chloe it is all relative uh, <laughs> or um you know uh, the rather inelegantly named ugly program all of that there's a tendency to go to these bilateral negotiations and that sort of deals around individual projects and ideas snowy is probably the giant one mm. um and look if it gets things done and they're good things that's marvelous they can be a massive waste of public money not so marvelous they can prop up uh dying industries in a way that's you know at the margins not good but really can't you know you, 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 there's an unstoppable tide here so they they're not that invidious they're just not very helpful um, so there's a question about whether it will um, if it's adopted and acted on will really have that flavor uh, and you know in the end I mean you can 
I think it's wise just not to get too excited by those things, uh, really, oh, and just look at the main game. Look, I, I think that's right. I suppose there's a there's a balancing act here, really, isn't there, Chloe? And it points to your earlier comment around, you know, those of us that have been around this space for a while have um, have learned to be pragmatic and to, and learned to work with what we're given, particularly at the national level. And that's not to say you don't keep making the point that, uh, as you say, um, good, robust economy-wide policy is absolutely necessary. But um, when something like the safeguard mechanism comes up and there's an opportunity for a conversation around that, um, there is a responsibility, I suppose, for those of us that are advocates and, and interested in ultimately moving the ball forward as far as we possibly can to make sure it is a, a productive process. And I guess the, the, the question that occurs to me, Chloe, is that we've, we've increasingly seen calls uh, from a whole range of corporates, including in the resources sector, for, for clarity around climate policy. Um, do you think that there is an appetite for you know, a really honest conversation around around something like the safeguard mechanism from the business community um, that are that are going to be uh, going to be subject to it if it indeed turns into something which has, has um, uh, some teeth to it. Or what's your read of the current mood in Australian in the Australian business community? I suppose you know on the one side you've got uh, the the post. Um, bushfire reality, the catastrophic bushfires that uh, that uh, occurred only two or three months ago. Um, but on the other side, you've got uh, the prospect of us heading into an extended economic downturn. There's lots of, you know, shifting currents going in lots of different directions. Where do you think business is at? Oh, I mean, that is a, you know, that's a very complicated uh, picture, I think, to paint, Luke, uh, particularly in the current environment where obviously people are very preoccupied with uh, the immediate impacts of COVID-19 and this very uncertain economic outlook. Mm. Um, I, I sense that in, in, in times of trouble, people, people kind of retreat to their corners. And so whatever they thought before gets a little bit amplified. So the, and, and, and this is why you can see there's a, there's um, a number of, parties calling for a green recovery, if you like, and, and saying, you know, this is the opportunity uh, to, uh, particularly if there's going to be investment in infrastructure and, and, and government wanting to stimulate uh, various kinds of economic activity to make sure that that's done in a way that's congruent with um, our long-term objectives for uh, combating climate change. And there's obviously a very large proportion of the business community now that is uh, comfortable to, to uh, with and, and, and committed to net zero by 2050 as, a, as an objective but from their point of view 2050 is sometime after 2021 <laughs> so how quickly <laughs> they really want to focus their minds on that is a slightly other yep. question yep. Um, but of course there are um, you know what the other thing that is happening is um, you know, markets are kind of fascinating because they're incredibly unforgiving. Mm. And so there are going to be some really swinging asset revaluations. You know, we haven't seen anything yet. And the, and the fossil fuel industry in particular is going to be um, quite uh, challenged by that. And, it, and, you know, it's not entirely clear how that will play out. I mean, obviously, people will defend their, their corner and, and suggest that defending that, that their corner is the qu quickest way to um, boost and protect the economy. We're going to have this debate about to what extent it's going to be a gas fueled recovery and whether that's you know a short term thing where gas plays a role as the transitional intermediate fuel or whether it means lots of investment in gas assets that will have to keep running for 20 or 30 years to make their money back. And so there will be a constant um, fight to keep them operating so i think that that's it, you know it's quite unclear where the business community will fall around all mm. of that mm. um a lot of it depends on how accessible capital is uh because you know if you have capital i mean there's never you know there's never going to be a better time to invest in uh, energy efficiency where it's got short paybacks uh, for example uh, cost of capital is low and mm. uh, you know you can get on with it but you've got a lot of other demands on your cash as well so uh, 
in my optimistic frame of mind, I think that this is um, you know, a, t a turning point and that, and that there will be quite a strong uh, coalition in the business community to move things in the right direction. But, um, you know, you also know that for some people, they just don't, won't, it's not a conversation that, that they're really able to have right now. Uh, my fear is that it, it almost becomes a bit of a Maslow's hierarchy situation. Everybody's in survival <laughs> yes. mode. And they, <laughs> they don't have the metaphorical sort of uh, roof over their head and, and dinner yeah. on the table. And so, you know, as you say, the, the concerns around uh, the, uh, the long-term health of the climate seems quite esoteric, despite the fact that we know that it's not. These, these are very yeah. pressing issues, but um, um, it, it perhaps uh, gets pushed off, as you say, beyond, uh, beyond 2021. We'll deal with that later. Yes, but, you know, even so, I mean, there are forces at play that are probably pushing things in the right direction. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, th I think there's, there's some grounds for optimism that the choices that will be made sort of step by step will, uh, people will, you know, when they make investment decisions, they'll have to have an eye to the longer term. So the, the, the bigger issue, I think, is that because of all the uncertainty, a lot of decisions will be deferred. Um, in some ways, that's good because it gives more time to, uh, for the better mousetrap to emerge and for, for, for people to, to uh, get comfortable with a strategic direction that might have seemed too difficult a couple of years ago. Um, but, you know, constantly deferring the transformation that we need, of course, is uh, a risk because uh, we'll, we'll run out of time. Uh, and, you know, having said that, I mean, globally, emissions will go down for the first time this year. So that buys a little bit of time. So it's a little bit of, um, yeah, again, it's, it's a balancing act about which, which, which force is stronger. Uh, it's a little hard to tell. Um, I'm generally an optimist by nature. I certainly look for sources of optimism. Uh, and, you know, some of the things that have been happening of later quite trying. I mean, I see this tussle, you know, if you just really take that step back into politics again, you know, the tussle between a drift towards more authoritarian totalitarianism, uh, and there's the force of that um, at play, but also I think um, uh, the genuine shock that people have experienced by seeing uh, the dole cues, by understanding the impacts of um, on our social fabric on the where you know where the weak spots are we felt quite comfortable and then we discovered that actually a lot of people aren't comfortable uh will drive some rethinking that perhaps will be positive so there's a you know there are those balances in terms of where what, what the kind of social uh um consensus is about what kind of society we want we want to be and we'll tolerate being yeah, that's, I think uh, you're right. I think up. I think there's been a um, a, a huge um, disruption in the I guess the global order, um, and and also I guess the various stakeholders from from businesses to governments to you know, community organisations um, uh, within Australia as well. And um, there's an opportunity for reflection, and one of those one of those vectors will be you know understanding perhaps lack of resilience in certain parts, mm. parts of uh, our economy and our society. Um, that's certainly been something I've been, I've been thinking about. Um, and it's not such a huge leap to go, well, we weren't very resilient in this context. Um, how are we going to fare against some of these big uh, impending threats that have been on the radar, but perhaps a little bit esoteric um, over the last number of years? Um, and it, it, it's going to be, I guess, it's incumbent on all of us to, to um, hold the two ideas in our head. We can't uh, not address the acute and immediate needs of the current crisis. But um, this is what I was talking to a uh, tenant about last week. Um, mm. It's trying to do that while thinking about the various levers that we have available to pull to address those needs. And some of them will move the ball in the right direction on some of those longer term threats as well. And, and perhaps they're the ones that should be closer to the top of the list, Chloe. Mm. Well, I, you know, I'm always looking for that happy coincidence of interest, coincidence of interests. Mm. And, uh, you know, interestingly, in the, the, the ERF um, review, uh, the King review, they talk about favouring uh, projects which have co-benefits 
even if you can't sort of overtly value, uh, you know, there's always, I've always had this idea in my mind about sort of stacking different. So you would have carbon credits and salinity credits and biodiversity credits and you, you know, you could have all of that, but that gets very complicated. Um, but in your mind, there are, there are things that, that, that have co-benefits and, um, you know, I think you're absolutely right about resilience that when you, you look at some of the, the things that have emerged and uh, the chickens that will come home to roost in the next few quarters, you know, they've really been quite suppressed by the amount of cash that the government's cut pumped into the economy but if you look at look at all that you say well there's, you know there were structural weaknesses in our economy anyway uh and a lack of resilience that you've pointed to and i you know, the, the kind of impulse to self-sufficiency it's got some downsides to it and it's got some upsides to it but i think that's partly about that um certainly in um the business community i mean they're going to have to really rethink uh, a lot of risk settings. I mean, fundamentally, you get resilience uh, through the strength of your balance sheet. And you now I was in a conversation yesterday with a, with a lot of business leaders talking about these very topics. And uh, you know, the, the idea that cash is king you know, comes up so much, and it really is about uh, your balance sheet. But when you look at our business processes, when you look at supply chain, and obviously people. Uh, have been a bit sh shocked by how deficient supply chains are, not just the dependence on China, you know, so China shuts down and suddenly you can't manufacture anything, that was one problem, or you don't have anything to sell, but more significantly, I think things like, you know, with food, and we've seen this particularly in the United States, where producers have um, not been able to sell their, their, their crops or through the usual channels. They haven't been able to establish alternatives and huge amount of food is being thrown away when people are going hungry. Um, you know, that is, causes a massive rethink. Um, maybe that's not so evident in energy, but I, I, I think some of that sort of, you know, runs in parallel under the surface. So, you know, what I see with, um, you know, in supply chain, the kind of just-in-time approach, which causes real problems when an axe goes through your supply chain somewhere. That was all about transferring risk from your enterprise to your suppliers. And, um, you know, casualization of the workforce, that's all about transferring risk from your enterprise to they're not even your employees anymore, they're independent contractors or whatever. Uh, I think all of that... Um, method of uh, transferring risk suddenly looks very hollow because the risk is still there and you still end up not being able to capture the revenues that you were expecting. So I think there's going to be a lot of rethinking around of all of that and um, you know the rewards are going to be to those entities that are agile and actually particularly in supply chain I have a private theory which is based in no evidence whatsoever, but those businesses that have been thinking about supply chain from an ESG point of view, um, environmental and social governance, you know, who've been thinking about um, whether it's uh, modern slavery in their supply chain or whether mm. it's, um, you, know, et, you know, ethical production in some way or whether it's just carbon accounting end to end. So they really know their supply chains intimately mm. and have been thinking about how they can manage that. I think that they're, they're the ones that are going to be really well placed to reposition themselves mm. post and also, you know, the circular economy. So um, there's no better way to shorten your supply chain than the circular economy. So I think businesses that have been thinking about these things in an ethical way um, are likely to be more agile and actually come out better than um, businesses which have just been sailing along on some of those same old precepts about how you manage costs by making mm -hmm. it someone else's mm -hmm. problem. Well, apart from anything else, Carly, they've done the heavy lifting of actually mapping all yes. those dependencies, right? Yes. And, um, and so when you find... Uh, that you're, there's a premium on resilience um, or there's a particular acute challenge you need to face and to, need to resolve in terms of your supply chain, um, you, you have that, that roadmap, as it were, to sort of start to, start to I guess, diagnose the issue and, and, and address it. Exactly. So, I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, as I say, this is, this, I've got no real sort of empirical evidence for this, but I really do uh, hope that it's there's a some podcast, reward. Chloe. You don't need empirical <laughs> evidence. We're just talking no, off the cuff. No, no I know. But, but, but it's, 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 a good, it's a good theory. Um, 
No, and, and I think um, the, the, the the impulse to self sufficiency, which I talked about, which is another sort of approach to managing risk. Mm -hmm. The uh, yeah, you know, I don't think we're all going to end up baking our own bread. Uh, much as you know, I mean, I know how to bake bread. Um, I don't eat enough bread for it to be worthwhile. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'd rather occasionally go to a cafe and have a slice that's toasted for me by someone else. <laughs> but so, so you know, we, we, it's not a matter of walk, walking away from a, a connected economy, mm. but just rethinking where, where where the risks are in that, and having and, and and perhaps applying a different set of values. I think that's that's definitely going to happen. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating point, and one that's kind of one of the issues. I guess it's it's a it's a little bit it's connected to energy, but it's a little bit separate to energy. But it, that that supply chain piece, as it relates to resilience and where the balance is going to be moving forward, and what the role of the government is in that context, and you know, decision making from private in, enterprise. Um, you know, if everyone's sort of maximising utility and pursuing low, lowest cost everything, um, that has certain implications. Um, is this a new sort of part of the social licence of business to be considering some of that stuff? Is government more interventionist in the future in, in terms of particular strategic interests um, that associated with supply chains and, and national sovereignty? I mean, and these are all fascinating questions that we haven't really mm. thought about in a deep way for a while. Well, I think actually, um, you know, social license, so there has been a lot of conversation about it. Again, it seems, you know, it seems like a long time ago, but it's only, <laughs> only a few months ago. I mean, there were a lot of, the, there's been a lot of discussion about how far that goes. And mm -hmm. again, in the kind of board context, there's been a lot of boardroom discussion about what is, you know, what is the legitimate role of, of of the corporation and of directors in pursuing particular things. I mean, you'll remember the flare up around um, Alan Joyce's and Qantas's support for marriage mm. equality and whether or not that was a legitimate thing for a business to pursue. Um, it, you know, in the end, you can kind of justify most of these things in terms of employee engagement. And I think certainly uh, doing the right thing on climate change and sustainability, employee engagement's been a very high uh, factor in, in in boards considering it's legitimate for them to focus on that and, and a customer as well but um so you know what how you think about well, where you are on the, on that spectrum uh you how much how tightly if you like it has to be uh coupled with immediate business interests and impact on, on the bottom line uh as opposed to you know longer term slightly less measurable things about about reputation and so on uh there's been a lot of Debate about about that, and and uh, I think a gradual shift to the sense that you have to have more of a more of an eye to your social license. Um, it, you know, it's been clear in climate change. I mean, really, what, one of the uh, biggest things that came out of the Paris uh, conference was the very prominent role that um, business played and. Uh, you know, I think we all came away with that in the sense that this, these, you know, to go to your earlier question, that business would lead uh, a lot of the, 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 the transformation and that um, it would be business interests that made it possible for govern, governments to um, then, you know, back that up with policies that, the, the, that are supportive to moving in that direction. And... Uh, uh, you know, even now, I mean, we, the, the talk is the government talks about a business-led recovery, and they're kind of right because it's uh, government can spend money to an extent, but it's in the end, it's private decisions, it's private capital investment decisions, and it's private consumption decisions that um, will change, you know, change the shape of the economy. Mm -hmm. Really, on any parameter that you look at, whether you look at education and training. Uh, whether you look at um, you know labour force parameters, whether you look at automation and AI and all of those sort of investment things, which can make a huge difference, and uh, of course whether when you look at um, emissions reduction, uh, that's fundamentally not going to happen without um, business being very committed to it. Uh, governments can certainly point the way and, and, and shape that in the way that we were talking about with it trajectory it can invest to support that it can regulate to require it and often that's 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 very helpful and actually the lowest cost way of getting from a to b um, but it can't 
you know it can't do it on its own and it, it and um that's uh that's why i think it's very important that that um you know organizations like yours i mean you re retain a very active dialogue with business about what's possible and uh what their role can be so uh chloe uh i think we're still on tuesday <laughs> so, so. <laughs> oh my god yes <laughs> So let's uh, let's fast forward to today, and of course, at six a.m. this morning, uh, the long-awaited consultation paper on the mm. technology investment roadmap was uploaded onto the the Dizer website. Um, uh, I guess it's it's important to say this is a consultation paper. This isn't the final yes. view, um, and so and I think the uh, the the government is uh, genuinely looking for input um, on, on this paper. Um, it's uh, unsurprisingly, uh, Chloe sort of already attracted a, a huge amount of interest given that mm. uh, this is the document that um, Minister Taylor and uh, the Prime Minister have been pointing to for, for, uh, for some months now as uh, a key plank of their emissions reduction agenda. Um, what, you've only, it's only been with you for, for a few hours. I think I, uh, I emailed it through to you at what seven thirty a.m. this morning or whatever it was. <laughs> well, I'm glad because I was listening to Mr. Taylor on the radio at the time. <laughs> I have to talk about this one. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, but you have, uh, I suppose, had a chance to glance through it. What was what was your immediate reaction? Look, I um, I think it's pretty good. I mean, it's easy to say. Look, we've had a lot of technology roadmaps mm. in the past. We've known for ever that you know, in a macro sense. We have the technology uh, and it's really not about whether the technology is there. It's about the um, economics of it and it's about the deployment pathways. Uh, so, you know, in uh, your first first fuel webinar, you were talking to Anna Scarbeck about that really excellent uh, report from uh, uh, Climate Works. Oh, yeah. And it would be very interesting to kind of map the two mm. documents onto each other, really. Um, so that's... Um, sort of doesn't need to be stated and and the the the, the governor the government is uh if you like putting all its eggs in the basket of technology just making it all happen and for the reasons we've discussed earlier it takes a little bit of guidance but you know within this roadmap that the, there is guidance there's 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 a number of steps i'll just uh, uh kind of call up the little schematic there oh, i've got it you know and so the stage one is setting a clear vision and you know the vision lacks uh, trajectory and targets, so, but otherwise it ha says some good things. And then you move through, and then uh, you get to um, identifying uh, the most efficient deployment pathways and setting economic targets for key technologies, which I guess is like you know for hydrogen, two dollars per kilogram. I think that's very helpful framing, and then. Um, balancing their over, overall investment portfolio it doesn't say building it but it acknowledges that government does invest through research and development in universities and there's arena and cefc and other agencies and if all of that was kind of orchestrated um i think that would be good um one of the things i ceaselessly say is you know the risk with a lot of government policy is that um you know apart from the stop start and the kind of piecemeal nature of it that you end up that the whole is less than the sum of its parts and so you know if this is a framework to pull all of that together in a way that really uh because this is about speed and scale that's what it's about you know so so that we, we can definitely technology can make a huge contribution it's not the only thing but it, it it's extremely important and it's speed and scale and if that can mean that the transformation of the capital stock of the economy uh, happens faster um, because of because of confidence about technologies that will really work for us uh, that's you know that's all a good thing so you know my, my first the, 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 the framing of it I think is is very it, it's, it's, it's very good within what it's intended to do uh, and the questions if you like come later as well if they make you know good calls about uh, where the prospective technologies for us, the ones that will need pushing along, um, uh, the deployment, that, that deployment pathway, how much muscle is the government going to put behind it? And I guess that's the question, you know, that's the question that's being kicked, the can that's been kicked down the road a little bit. So we'll wait and see. Um, you know, when you look at the specifics of the technologies they've looked at, I, I think it's very easy for people to be 
distracted by side issues you know for example we talked about the emissions reduction for the, the king review and one of those recommendations was around carbon capture and storage and it's in here too um gas is in here and um you know small modular reactors are in here uh, and there will be people who are kind of outraged and get all carried away by that my view is that um you know you could waste a lot of time and effort on them but uh they're very constrained in their uh potential deployment mm -hmm. um nuclear power i think you know i mean the, the effort that you'd have to go to to make that acceptable in australia is enormous it would at best be a very sort of niche uh source of energy um, i think people's concerns about safety are probably misplaced um you know i'd be worrying much more about e-waste and uh, plastics mm -hmm. In, in the environment than you know a handful of small modular reactors but you know it's so you'd say well why would you waste a lot of effort on that it doesn't it's not likely to shift the dial very much whereas hydrogen and i know that you haven't maybe drunk the hydrogen kool-aid <laughs> along with the rest of us but the reason why hydrogen's you know so appealing is because it's the one thing that prospectively replaces our fossil fuel exports sure, sure. and you know if we could achieve that and there's lots of ifs and buts about that and you know we're not the only economy that's going hell for leather for hydrogen production but if we could then that would be fabulous so the things that, that we can get to at speed and at scale are definitely worth identifying and government putting some muscle behind and i, and I think this road road map is really about that so Yes, I mean, lots of opportunity to, for people to respond to what it says. But, uh, you know, it's really about, as always, you know, the process. Does it operate at scale? Is, 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 is it, you know, is the, is the real muscle behind it? Or does it end up being kind of frittered away in a you know, handful of vanity projects that don't really touch the sides? And I guess that's the question to be asked. Mm. We've done a fair bit of work on the role of arena in the last little while. Um, mm. like Haven't we all? Other yeah, yes. indeed. And, you know, like a number of other stakeholders, we've been concerned about the future of future mm -hmm. arena um, just because of the, uh, the way the funding works. Um, you know, we thought um, that they were likely to run out of uh, 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 funding to allocate uh, this year. Um, we'll see how the, the current crisis sort of may shift those timelines. But nevertheless, there was, there's a need for a, another allocation um, to mm. arena. Um, and so in that context, we've been doing a fair bit of thinking at the Energy Efficiency Council and, and some, with some of our partners around the role of, the role of technology innovation. Um, and uh, one of the things that we, we hit upon is the, uh, the thought that there's kind of two types of innovation we need to be doing as a nation. Um, one is around technology, right? And that's mm. hydrogen fits fairly and squarely in that category as, you know, as smart people keep coming on this podcast and telling me, Chloe, uh, it's a, it's a huge <laughs> opportunity that, uh, that uh, it deserves our time and attention. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a genuine, you know, mm. technology innovation, driving down the cost, cost curves, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's, and then there's innovation in deployment, and there's technologies that we have now, which are the ones that many of the ones that Anna pointed to uh, on the first episode of First Fuel, uh, which we, we in sectors which we understand well, um, if we had the will, um, we could really uh, start you know, seriously reducing, reducing the emissions profile in areas like buildings and, and our electricity system. It's really about working out how to create the business models and these, in the incentives and the framework for mm. driving that technology into the market. And one of the things that um, I'm sure we'll talk with, we're having uh, Alan Pears on the podcast next oh, week. Fantastic. Chloe. Yeah. And one of the things that he's very passionate about is making sure that the innovation con conversation doesn't just focus on technology, um, but focuses on, I guess, you know, the, the social systems and the economic systems and the, the frameworks in which that technology necessarily exists um, and which is very determinative of the degree to which it's deployed. Um, yes. Do you have any thoughts on that? 
Uh, well, I think I think the question is absolutely the right one. I, and and um, you know, we talk about uh, innovation. You know, it's 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 ten percent inspiration and ninety percent perspiration, and it's mm. it is actually that effort of deployment and application. And I, you know, I, I think we, you know, even though I, I I said at the beginning, I think it's very difficult to shift the dial across the whole economy without something resembling a carbon price. I mean, that, that just kind of makes everything else easier. It's certainly not sufficient on its own. And, uh, you know, going back to those kind of market economic tools around incentives is, is, is clearly not adequate. I mean, sometimes a little bit of straight subsidy does help. Um, regulation helps. I, I actually, you know, I, I came to Australia to do a lot of deregulation and, and um, you know, I've had a lot of uh, Damascene moments, I guess. And uh, one of them is really understanding the way that regulation can drive innovation and that very often if you set, you know, particularly if you set a kind of threat of regulation, well, in X time, you have to meet this standard. Yeah, it's quite remarkable how uh, industries rise to that. So there's mm -hmm. a role for regulation. But I think there's also, you know, uh, much more attention needs to be paid to I mean as always you know who is it who is the decision maker and what what are they taking into account so instead of sort of saying oh you know people are just irrational in their decisions they're not they hmm. just take things into account that haven't been quantified by the modelers so what do they take into account so whether you're talking about individual household consumers or whether you're talking about businesses who make the investment decisions really focusing on um, you know, essentially the behavioural economics of that and, and yeah. what what will give them confidence to make the choice that is socially beneficial. And, uh, you know, there are so many places where you think, well, there, there does seem to be mar market failure here. People aren't doing what's in their own best interests, which would also um, be in the better interests of the community at large. So really looking at what's standing in the way of that um you know it's it, it's the conundrum around energy efficiency but it also appears in, in in other areas where you think well why 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 is this so difficult to move along uh and often it's because you know because of habit or because of um you know there's there's there's, there's something in the chain of activity that gets in the way so I, you know i i think that whole deployment question is is you know absolutely is the guts of it i think um as Anna was talking about, I mean, we can see the sectors where the emissions reduction can happen. We can see um, the mature technologies, the demonstrated technologies. We know what the emerging technologies are that are prospective. Uh, so all of that is well mapped out. It's really much more about deployments. Um, so I'm very interested to see what Alan has to say about that. Uh, and mm. I don't have a, have a lot of wisdom, but I do know that it needs very different ways of thinking from a policy point of view. And also um, that sectoral approach is so important, Chloe, because it, it's actually different levers, different mm. different um, sort of carrots and sticks. And as my friend Christoph uh, von Spessart would say from uh, the German chamber, um, mm. it, tambourines, you know, how do you get people excited about this stuff? Yes. All those things need to work, need to work uh, together. Um, and, it's sort of some of the things I've been reflecting on as I've been going through the roadmap. Um, listing technologies um, is and, and working through some of the, the, the particular issues associated with technologies is important. It's also important to situate them in, within context because mm -hmm. heat pumps, for example, you know, called out have oh, yeah. uh, you know significant significant role to play in the in electrification. Um, play very different roles and there's different very different pathways for deployment in, in the industrial sector versus the the building sector. Um, just completely different sets of stakeholders, um, uh, even between commercial and, and residential. These are these are different types of conversations, and in some cases, we can you know, in the commercial building sector, yeah, pretty sophisticated group of large property groups who uh, are up for the, the chat about the role of uh, the, the role of electrification in their in their assets. Um, oh. uh, whereas residential, it's 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 going to be an incentive piece and a um, you know probably a regulatory a regulatory pre yes. piece um, that is going to drive that deployment. So really, really careful sort of uh, bespoke policy making is going to be going to be required to sort of take the the technology piece and the innovation piece and actually situated in particular particular contexts, Chloe. 
Yes, well, I, you know, look, I, 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 um, I mean, this is one of my hobby horses, really, and has been uh, for a long time. Is that uh, when you, you know, when you talk about technology, uh, it always feels like supplier push. Mm. And uh, if when, but when you talk about transformation and change, you really have to start from consumer call and consumer in, and and really think about you know and 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 really focus on, as I said, who are the decision makers who are going to change their behavior, the way they do things, or who are going to make that investment decision to replace, you know, when either to replace something actually before the end of its useful life or when it reaches the end of its useful life, they're going to replace it with something that's more energy efficient or um, perhaps gives them the same benefit by a completely different method, which might not need you know, an investment in a capital item at all. So starting from that end seems to be enormously different. And it's hard to understand why really, because we have a whole world out there, which is driven by consumer insights and big data. And, you know, the people who are really shaping our lives, who are the, you know, the, the, the um, fangs, you know, who, who, who are the ones who present to us, uh, well, you could buy this or you could have this experience or you could, watch this i'll give you, I'll give uh, you a theory who, chloe about yes. why it's hard it's about uh, i think part of it at least is uh, is the silos that exist in the in, hmm. in government um hmm. and so you know yes the buildings minister you know you know is dealing with the the national construction code and that has an element of of uh of uh you know regulating the the energy performance of, of new buildings um but you know the the system level impact of poorly built buildings is something that's being grappled with by the energy minister or the yes. in, increasingly the energy and the climate climate minister. Um, and it's very hard within our sort of Westminster system and the division of ministerial responsibilities to, to without, you know, a very clear um, uh, agenda set from the prime minister or the premier down for those two, those two conversations to speak to each other. Uh, yeah, look, I think that's true. And I mean, it, again, I mean, it just seems infuriating that we're still talking about this. I'm getting very tired. Uh, because, <laughs> Sorry. You know, well, no, 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 but in a sense, you know, when I was um, the secretary in the Victorian government, we were mm. talking about joined up government. Mm. Um, if you go back to Jeff Kennett, I mean, his creation of the super departments was the idea that you would organise government portfolios around the big themes you know and so he had this idea of what the big themes were which were things like you know infrastructure and so you do that and so obviously you have to be you you know you have to have an organizing principle you can't just have everything in one big blob but it has to be appropriate to the time and every so often there will be a push on an issue uh domestic violence for example i mean christine nixon and um some others worked really hard to get the health, uh, you know, human services working with police and so on and so forth to tackle that uh, particular challenge. So it's not that government isn't aware of it or that it can't be done, but the incentives, you're right, I mean, very quickly uh, go down to fragmentation and um, this, you know, very, um, yeah, very siloed way of thinking about things. It seems very difficult to work across those lines. Um, you know, in the energy sector, I mean, we're talking, and again, have been for a long time, about sector coupling and, you know, the relationship between mobility and urban design and um, energy efficiency, all of these things get tied together. Um, you know, some of the work at Monash around the net zero precinct, uh, mm-hmm. you know, again, I mean, this is about this idea that you, you take a different slice through all of these different things that are traditionally arranged in separate portfolios. Um, so you're right, but it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's an insight that we've had for ever. And so it is, it's, it is quite surprising in a way that it's still so difficult when, you know, it's clear that there are some very big challenges to be met that cut across lines. Um, I mean, just in energy, electricity, gas, transport, fuel, the way that they're regulated differently and um, is a problem. So, I mean, it's, it, it, it happens at all sorts of micro levels. But I genuinely think if you start with the consumer as, as, as you know, your starting point, you think about the whole person and the whole yep. business, yep. Um, that might be a way in. And that, that, that certainly for um, this kind of transformation is better than trying to push it from the other end. Increasingly, I, I think, Chloe, that 
that the world's going to change around government and government's going to need to respond. And so even yeah. with something like uh, what Anna was pointing to, electrification is a, is a key pillar of the uh, decarbonisation futures report that we're both referring to. Um, you know, electrification in vehicles has implications for, you know, the, the, obviously the grid and the network. Um, it has implications for the buildings in which they're plugged into. Those mm-hmm. buildings are increasingly going to be dependent on, on the, um, the production of uh, low emissions building products, which, you know, ideally would be sourced lo- locally as part of that low emissions story. All these things are, uh, are going to become increasingly interconnected. Um, and it's going to be incumbent on governments to work out how how to deal with that. Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's right, and I you know I, I think it will be pulled through in a sense by some change. I mean, uh, certainly in terms of uh, regulation, um, there needs to be space for innovation and exploration where. Uh, different kind of business models, if you like, are experimented with. And I think one of the biggest challenges is that um, there there are big barriers to that. So we can see this in, um, you know, DER, um, Distributed um, Energy Resource Coordination and Demand Management and all of that. You know, it's really very hard with a very, you know, what is a very regulated sector to then sort of come along and say, well, I've got a whole other business model to try out that will provide benefits to um, owners of these these assets um, and aggregate it up in a way that, that works for everyone. That's that's challenging to do. But, you know, if you, if you just get that little foothold, then I think those demonstrations then do push back into what government needs to do. And, um, you know, we're seeing this happening, I think, in, in, in a slow sort of way in the post-2025 market design considerations, for example, which recognises that, um, the market design needs to change to accommodate that, but there has to be that foothold of some kind of demonstration that it, that, that it's it, it's a real thing that people are interested in and can benefit from first. Now, for everyone that is uh, logged into the webinar, um, I should note that Chloe and I had a conversation before we started recording, and we said, "Well, how on earth are we going to uh, discuss all this in the, in the space of an hour?" <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to try and get through the guts of it in the hour, and I think we've done that. Um, we're going to keep chatting for another 15 or so minutes. Um, you're welcome to stick around um, because there's, there's a couple of questions that uh, we had discussed covering uh, that we haven't yet got to um, that, we, uh, that we really want to for the podcast. But if you need to go, if you've got another meeting, um, we won't hold it against you if you, if you chuff off. So, Chloe, just on that on that regulatory piece and that, that I guess that reform agenda, um, you were a member of the Finkel review and one of the central yeah. recommendations was um, the need to leverage demand response um, as we transition to higher penetrations of renewables. Now, um, as you know, the Energy Efficiency Council, um, since it was founded really in 2009 with Rob Murray Leach, has been a, a passionate advocate for demand response. But um, we are starting to feel like Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football this, at this point. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, we've had a few runs at it and we keep, we keep, keep ending, in, ending up flat on our back. And um, obviously there was a, we were, we were anticipating a, a decision, I believe, in the November last year. Um, at the last minute, uh, that got deferred, uh, I believe, to, to June. That's now coming up. And, of course, we're in the midst of a global pandemic now. And, and certainly news in some quarters that uh, regulatory reform right now is, is not what we should be, should be focused on. Um, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous that uh, this whole DR thing might be uh, uh, a repeat of, uh, of, of past uh, issues that we've had with actually getting this thing across the line. Have you got any thoughts on, I guess, the, the broad issue of how we should be approaching some of these long-standing sort of uh, reform issues in the context of COVID-19? Well, I th- you know, I, I, I do think we have to be realistic about it to the extent that um, there's a question of bandwidth and whether people can apply their minds to it. So I don't think it's surprising if um, some of these things are put onto a slightly slower track. I know there's this sort of conspiracy theory that um, this is really all at the behest of the um, incumbents who are finding this as the latest convenient excuse to uh, stop anything from changing and undermining their market um, dominance. Uh, But... Certainly on DER, I mean, I think it is genuinely quite complicated. And, you know, the trick here is um, 
to really get the benefits flowing, you have to think very carefully about the governance so that um, the when you are orchestrate, you know, when whatever um, intermediary, if you like, is 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 orchestrating all of these um, small sources of demand response, that the benefits of that are shared in a in a fair way between the owner of the um, asset that's being uh, tuned down uh, and the sort of wider community and indeed the the entrepreneur who's who's doing the aggregation so that's that's quite a challenging regulatory question and then how you you know how, how you fit that all in that micro activity with the macro management of the grid is quite complicated so there's no real getting away from that um, and I think that's why you know what I'm keen on at the moment is just seeing as uh, you know the, the various uh, experiments, if you like, that are taking place uh, with microgrids and virtual power plants and you know Monash's um, uh, Monash um, market operator um, trial and all of those sorts of things, which are trying to just to sort of uh, carve off variations on the theme and I, I, I think that's also the good because there'll be a lot of problem solving that happens in that uh, way um, so the biggest thing is not to not to have all of that wither um, because the big when we get to the big market reforms certainly once they're there they're not going to be changed very quickly and uh, you know we've seen things like the power of choice which you know sounds like a splendid idea and really was I think total fizzer because it didn't really focus on the right things um, you don't undo those or repeat them very quickly mm. um, uh, so yes I think I think it's inevitable um, for some good reasons that some of this will be deferred I don't think it means it's going away. our DR and demand response is absolutely not going away I mean I was you know writing about this when I was at Telstra at the beginning of the century uh, so it's not kind of none of this is new and it takes a long time for it all to kind of come together in a way that builds scale but I think the the um, logic behind it is so forceful and mm. and the quality of the um, technology you know the digital technology that allows that orchestration is improving all the time um, the standards will gradually come in for you know, inverters and all those sorts of things that will, will improve it. So don't, please don't despair about this. I, I think there's a real, you know, um, maybe this is just my age speaking and I really think it's time for next generation. <laughs> lay lay some over, wisdom but, on me, Chloe. <laughs> but, no, 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 no. But I mean, there's a, there's a real misunderstanding of how long it takes to get serious transformation going. And, you know, it, it's kind of, decades of working away at it and then there's just this moment you know it's like a magic moment it really is a hockey stick I think with with a lot of um, transformational change where all of that suddenly comes together and away you go and of course people are a lot of people only see the uptick and they don't realize that there was decades of struggle um, leading to that point so I, I, I'm slightly surprised we're still there with DR but I, I can see why because it is quite um, uh, in the end I mean it's quite seismic in, in terms of how the whole you know once you aggregate it up to the market as a whole it's quite seismic in the way the whole market works so you're not going to get there, there in a single yeah, bound. Sure. And look, from our perspective, there was there, there were some that were concerned, I suppose, that uh, in this first instance, we're not going to DR in all markets. It's a, it's, there, was a, there was a view that perhaps we should be going to residential at the same time as we were looking mm -hmm. at for commercial industrial applications. And, and that, was, that certainly wasn't our view um, for mm -hmm. that reason, because, you know, let's, let's get this bedded down with the more sophisticated users that have the bandwidth to engage in what is a, effectively a new market um, for these services, um, yes. you know, integrating them into the wholesale market. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a pragmatic way through this. Um, generally the, the, I guess the, to the degree that I'm frustrated and I'm delighted to be characterized as a, a frustrated youth. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, because, because just you, you go around the house as many times as I have, Luke, you'll find out. But um, 
you know, the, the transaction costs are important. So yes. generally, although you know you can see, you can see the theoretical proposition, um, it seems to me that generally uh, trying to aggregate up very small pieces of um, demand response to um, create sufficient value to be able to then share that for everybody to get some benefit is, is, is pretty tough going. So it does make sense to start at the commercial end and uh, there may be better ways. Um, there are definitely, uh, you know, ways that are available now to incentivize households that, that are um, less complicated. Uh, they may be not as sort of theoretically efficient. Um, and actually, you know, that thought, if I might digress for a moment, takes me back to the King review of the, Emissions Reduction Fund, because I, I saw um, uh, your um, Rob's, Rob's co comments on that, welcoming some aspects of it. And I thought, well, you know, really in terms of energy efficiency, um, there's good reason why the Emissions Reduction Fund hasn't been tremendously supportive for it. And again, it's this aggregation problem. You know, you've got this very elaborate, complex scheme to create certificates. Uh, units mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of compliance costs that go with that and quite honestly if you know that you want in a, a, given that this is government spending we're talking about why go through all of that palaver of all of that and then the auctions and all of the other things in order to get government money in the hands of uh, things that you know are worth doing and just need a little bit of subsidy to kick them along I mean that you know a simple grant you mentioned arena earlier you know a simple grant scheme might be easier um, one of the things I thought was interesting the technology roadmap document was uh, this the analysis of the CEFC spending and I hadn't realized that you know 38 percent of their uh, commitments have gone to um, energy efficiency Indeed. Uh, and that, that that was really more than I thought and it and so if the problem is uh, people need money up front to invest in things which have a reasonably short payback in fact so it's not that they don't make sense but they need the money up front again trying to bend the emissions reduction fund out of shape to have upfront crediting so that you know the energy efficiency projects can get over the line you know that just seems very complicated compared to uh, what the CEFC could do or what you know say what a straight out grant can do so it's not always that the big market reforms are the best way to pull through some of these um, innovations uh, that you know often there's the, the simpler simpler ways that just get get things moving I think that's right I suppose our engagement around the emissions reduction fund over the, the journey has been going to your earlier point around working with what's available mm. um, there have been, I suppose, the mechanism of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. It is a little bit hamstrung because it does deal at a very large level. And yes. so it necessarily, you know, there's, diff there's things like the aggregation programs that it runs with the retail banks, which have been reasonably successful in driving, you know, reduced interest rates for energy efficiency and energy management uh, investments in, in business and in the industrial sector in particular. But it sort of turns into a little bit of a Rube Goldberg machine <laughs> where, you know, they'll directly fund very, very, very large projects and then everything else is kind of, like, you know, through various yeah. intermediaries. And, um, yeah, so I suppose our um, concern as an industry would be that um, there has been various, various um, support mechanisms for a whole range of, range of technology deployment uh, at the federal level um, mm. and the and invariably you know energy efficiency which is a, this huge opportunity of course um, uh, is is playing playing second fiddle and the with the amount of low cost of, cost abatement that's available in that space albeit you know as we were talking been talking about it with over the last few weeks on the podcast you know there's there's different opportunities and barriers in different parts of the economy so it requires fairly careful policy making but um i guess mm. we'd say that there's a there's a it merits more attention than it has over the over the last little while oh. oh look i don't disagree with that at all and um you know it is one of the kind of mysteries really that um you know whether it's the energy productivity or energy efficiency or whatever it is. I mean, it's mm. not that it isn't acknowledged as being a thing mm. uh, and you can see the benefits, but it's almost because, well, it should be, you know, people should just be able to do it because um, the, the returns are so good. Um, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't need to push it along, but it goes back to what you were saying earlier. I think that for 
um, those sorts of investment choices, uh, you need you need you need to start at the end of well, what is it that will really make it easier for mm. for for people to make those investments? And, and I don't think um, the elaboration of um, a carbon crediting scheme is really ever going to cut it. And uh, th th there are better ways, but I agree with you. There should be some ways. I mean, we know that labelling makes a difference, and all these things make a difference. But actually, a little bit of cash to grease the wheels uh, makes a difference too. And I'm not surprised you're uh, frustrated by that um, strange sense that you're the poor relation in uh, what ought to be the first fuel. I mean, what can I say? It's well, not there. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> just to just to pull a hypothetical phrase from the air, Chloe. Um, so, are you up for a, a conversation now about um, implications of COVID on the energy sector broadly? Um, or are you flagging? Yes. Yeah. No, no, no. I, well, I could keep on going. Yeah, this day. <laughs> I could keep going all day. Uh, your your audience will fade away, I'm sure. Well, we'll see. Um, yes, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because when you look at Australia, the data suggests you know maybe. 3% reduction in energy consumption, which doesn't kind of fit with um, what we understand of the economic impacts. Although actually, we're even even with, um, you know, it's been so, the, 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 the impacts have been so cushioned uh, that I don't think we'll, you know, we can really see um, it flowing through until the next quarter. So, um, you know, some economists uh, forecasting you know in the March course there's really very little impact to be seen but perhaps in the June quarter the economy might have shrunk by as much as eight percent um, you know if you look at retail spending of course it went up eight and a half percent in March it plummeted by 18 percent in April it's probably recovering in in, in May so um, you know some some of those um, impacts I think have um, you know yet to flow through and it looks very different from what the International Energy Agency is saying. I mean, they're saying that countries in full lockdown experienced something like 25% uh, reduction in um, energy demand and countries in partial lockdown, which I guess is what we are, um, an average of 18%. Mm -hmm. So all of that suggests that um, there will be further contraction of energy demand in the short term in Australia. Um, because prices are set at the margins, I mean, you do see, you know, obviously when you look at the electricity futures, uh, gas prices have come right off um, in the face of kind of global uh, the global trends there. Uh, negative <laughs> prices uh, briefly for, for oil, um, mainly because you, know, you have to keep on producing it. There's nowhere to store it. So you literally do have to pay people to take it away. Um, uh, so there's all those imbalances that are happening in um, energy production where you get these massive supply and demand imbalances and then of course prices plummet and the question is how long does that last and tenants was talking about that in your last uh, podcast but however you look at it it goes back to this this issue of what does it do to asset values so what you'd expect to see is some really swinging asset revaluations um, thermal coal coal mines um, for example, will suddenly start to look quite sick in many parts mm. of the world and probably here too. But so the, the, the owners of those may lose a lot of money. They may walk away. But of course, the asset is still there. So the question is whether somebody else is game to pick it up at a bargain price or whether they see it as you know, coming along with so much liability, they won't touch it. And I, you know, personally, I think fossil fuel assets will have that shadow over them. So um, there could be some quite significant restructuring globally that goes on and possibly in Australia, but more generally because of the uncertainty of you know, what kind of recovery we're gonna have, I don't think any person can seriously believe we're gonna have a V-shaped recovery like the Reserve Bank is currently forecasting. Mm -hmm. Stephen Kennedy, the Secretary of Treasury, uh, indicated he doesn't think so. Um, a lot of business leaders I talk to are kind of pretty gloomy about, you know, the idea of an L-shaped recovery. So it's like a goes from recession to depression and it sits there for a very long time. But um, a lot of people don't think that's right either. And, I, you know, there's, 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 there's um, what's the word? There's a kind of speed in the economy. It's partly to do with the connectedness and mm -hmm. the um, digitalization. That means it's just seems to me everything tends to happen. It might be more acute, but it happens faster. So, 
all of that uncertainty, of course, where it really wears down is on investment. And, you know, we've had fantastic levels of investment in renewables um, with depressed prices and um, a depressed uh, demand, demand situation. It's hard to see people racing to invest. Mm. Uh, so renewables have captured, you know, not surprising, a larger share of that declining market. But I don't think that's necessarily anything to um, cheer about. That's just kind of arithmetic. Um, so I think there's a lot of questions about what will happen next and where um, people will be inclined to invest. Um, I'd like to see more investment in those kind of systemic things, the dig digital side of things, as we were discussing, certainly network um, I think there's, you know, a lot of really interesting questions about how the distribution networks develop. Um, again, you know, they sort of, you know, everybody focuses on transmission, but actually all the dynamics are happening at the distribution mm -hmm. level and distribution mm -hmm. networks are generally quite sort of uh, old and um, not particularly, you know, well designed for the current demands. And you, you were talking about, um, the link with um, electric vehicles, for example, mm. and all that sort of happens at distribution level. So there are definitely, you know, there are, there are transformational investment opportunities that will come out of it, but how confident people will be to invest um, is quite unclear. So, I mean, this all, all just paint, paints the picture to me of things being deferred, some policy decisions will be deferred for good or ill. Um, but probably won't take us backwards. Um, the crunch time around uh, security of supply will be pushed back a bit, probably. Yep. Investments will be pushed back a bit. Um, but, I, you know, when you look at the real macro, you know, it's really hard not to see the momentum towards decarbonisation continuing. Um, it may be lumpier, there may be some, you know, spectacular um, exits, but certainly I don't think on any scenario you could see spectacular reinvestment in exploration and uh, development of fossil fuel assets. So that's also the good, really. Mm. And I suppose, um, and maybe we'll make this the last question, uh, Chloe, uh, the theme of uh, the first three episodes of First Fuel has been around uh, the opportunity for a clean recovery, for government stimulus to be focused in areas which are aligned with uh, the decarbonisation of the economy, that long-term long-term goal. We talked a little bit about the uh, the win-win opportunities. Um, do you think that's that's some that's a, a fruitful area? And I, I suppose if if you were advising governments, you know, among the various opportunities that are available um, that are aligned with that, um, where would you be focusing? Hmm. Well, I think you know some of the things that uh, we've already talked about. Um, I mean, absolutely, it's uh, clean recovery is a win-win. And um, I think I would focus a lot on on the, um, you know, to use the jargon I just used earlier, sector coupling, you know, the, the, the mm. so uh, the link, electrification, the link with transport. Uh, I think that's really important to accelerate that. And, 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 you know, obviously the government is still quite equivocal about electric vehicles even though they're you know they're in the technology roadmap mm. so you could certainly give a boost on that i mean it just says you know they just say well the fleet takes 10 years to turn over well they could actually do something about that mm. uh so that would be one the um really investing in the digital assets i think would be very helpful um so some of those things that really help sort of tie to tie together um uh the different sectors um, i've spoken about distribution i'm not sure how much shovel ready stuff there is but uh, there's got to be some uh, that would be really worth um, piling into um, and you know as you know i mean a certain amount of retrofitting uh, all of those things in the in the construction sector i mean they're quite um, labor intensive uh, and can make um, you know a really big difference and certainly you know if government's going to invest in social housing which it ought to uh, well just make sure that you build those social houses to a really high standard of energy efficiency make that investment up front so a lot of it's about things they might be thinking about anyway um, you know it was really good for example to see um, the city of Melbourne I mean coming out with their uh, 
policy. I mean, they'll be running a deficit, but they'll be investing in bicycle infrastructure that um, cheered me up as a cyclist. <laughs> you know, these are, these are simple things, but allow some of the, the new habits that we're developing uh, to, um, I think people have developed under, under, under the lockdown to persist because, and, and, and they're fairly quick. So those are the sorts of things I would advocate for. Okay, Chloe. Well, um, I want to thank you for your time and especially the fact that you've allowed us to go a little bit over. Um, I always enjoy our conversations and I'm, de <laughs> I'm delighted that you've allowed me to record one of them for the purposes of the podcast. Um, I, feel look, it, I feel it could do with a good edit, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how we go. There's a, there, there's a lot, of, uh, lot of gold in there. I wouldn't want to cut too much of it out. So, um, Chloe, uh, you wear so many hats, I'm not sure where to point people. Is there, uh, is there a particular uh, initiative or, or role if, if they want to sort of connect with you and your work? Where, would, where do you suggest they go? Well, I'm not, I'm not a big um, social media user for, for, for reasons of um, abundant caution, really. Um, uh, but I, I am on LinkedIn, so that's mm. the easiest way, uh, place for people to find me. Wonderful. And uh, as you reminded me earlier, I probably have to update my profile, but I'll do that <laughs> later. <laughs> All right, well, 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 thanks again, Chloe. Um, uh, uh, I hope you continue to enjoy your, your period of uh, isolation. Um, uh, I, hope it, uh, I hope it continues to suit you and uh, look forward to, to more chats on First Fuel down the track. Brilliant. Thank you, Luke. I've enjoyed it. Okay, so that wraps up our fourth episode of First Fuel. Uh, if you have comments, you can find me on Twitter, perhaps not Chloe. My handle is uh, at Luke Menzel, but if you're looking for another follow, there is, of course, the Energy Efficiency Council at EE Council, which I'm pleased to say has developed a pretty sharp meme game since the team wrested control of the account away from me. If Twitter is not your thing, you can email the team. The address is firstfuel at eec.org. Au and uh, every episode of First Fuel is broadcast as it's recorded, so you can jump on Zoom, listen in live, or even contribute questions in the chat. Now, we had questions today. Um, I didn't ask any of them because I had too many of my own. So uh, <laughs> you want to take uh, that risk on, um, I encourage you to look up our list of upcoming recording times at eec.org.au forward slash podcasts. But for now, it's goodbye from us, and we'll catch you soon. So, Chloe, uh, and for everybody on the webinar, that will, is where the podcast will end, but um, everyone can still hear us if they're on the line. So, Chloe, be, be warned of that, um, and, but uh, we'll, we'll chat for another couple of minutes before we uh, stop broadcasting. Hmm. All right, I'm kind of fascinated about what those questions are. So. <laughs> well, you know, for people that are still on the line, we can, uh, we can jump in. Um, there were some good ones. I, I reckon this is, might be an old mate of yours. Um, uh, Chloe, John Shaw. Yes. Um, oh. So, so John's asked, um, you might know that John's working for the New South Wales government these days. Um, mm. He has asked, uh, the King Review looks at a carbon exchange rate for LGCs. Could this be a stepping stone to linking environmental schemes, LRIT and the RF in the future? Uh, well, the answer is yes. I mean, it's, it's slightly kind of out of context in the King Review um, uh, if there had been a clean energy target, as the Finkel Review recommended, then fungibility between LGCs and, or um, uh, RECs, rather, renewable energy certificates and um, carbon uh, units would have been very sensible. So, uh, you know, it, it seems to me a little bit, um, there's no particular context where it's useful at the moment, but um, if in the future something like a clean energy target was implemented then that would be a sensible thing to have in the background and the other question Chloe is around heat pumps um, it's a long question I'm just scanning it um, okay so I'll just read it just discussion earlier regarding heat pumps and, or, and obstacles re-uptake in the residential sector, apartments specifically, it seems gas is very much locked in in the southern states, centralised or individual units. The tech seems to exist for heat pump at scale for apartments. Da, 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 da. But in terms of carbon abatement, if the emissions associated with gas leakage before end use, the heat pumps might actually look much better in GHG emissions terms. Any thoughts? So... Heat pumps in apartments, I suppose, is my son of that question. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I think uh, heat pumps, are, I mean, it certainly is pretty hard to retrofit. So, you know, they're very much for high density new build, um, make a lot of sense, I think. Um, 
and uh, you know, in terms of the the gas technologies and whether they're properly counted for the greenhouse gases. I mean, of course, that, that's, that's right. I mean, it's interesting when you look at Victoria, we get more of our energy in Victoria um, all up from gas than we do from electricity, I think uniquely amongst the states. So it's, it's um, a very significant fuel, um, but uh, we are running out, uh, or our straight supplies are running out. So uh, without um, something like an import terminal, it's not a very long-term play. Uh, so yes, I mean, I I, um, I I don't know a lot about the economics of heat pumps, to be honest, in terms of installation costs, but I should have thought that there were, in new builds, they, they were a pretty attractive proposition. And gas, ga gas appliances are a riskier proposition just because of the outlook for gas supply in Australia. Okay. Well, we've... Uh... We've exercised your uh, your time enough for today, Chloe. Thank you so much. Pleasure as always. Yeah, pleasure was mine, Luke. I hope we'll talk in person, face to face, possibly soon. I I do I do hope that we can do that sooner rather than later. That would be wonderful. So um, in the meantime, uh, stay safe, and and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.